This is the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, where we have conversations with everyday martial artists about their histories and how martial arts influence their daily lives. You are listening to the abbreviated version of this podcast, which is the first 20 minutes or so of the show. Please consider supporting the show by subscribing on our Patreon page, www.patreon.com slash M-A-L-M-A-G. And for about the price of one coffee shop coffee per month, you can get access to four new podcasts each month one week before their YouTube release dates. You also have access to all of our existing shows, which at this point is about 100 hours of shows for you to enjoy. Individual shows can be purchased at our Gumroad page. That is malmag.gumroad.com. In this episode, I sit down on Zoom and I talk with North Carolina's Dick Harrell. We talk about how he got into martial arts, what it was like studying with Larry Hartzell in the early days, and what it's like to train Muay Thai in Thailand. Sit back and enjoy. Welcome to the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, and we're starting into Season 2 here, and we've got a guest, someone that I'm very excited to talk to, and this is a gentleman I, I knew of uh, through reputation, because one of my first instructors in Jeet Kune Do was Larry Hartzell, and this gentleman was a student and partner of Larry Hartzell, so I've heard uh, Mr. Dick Harrell's name for a long time, and am very happy to get him on the show here so I can talk to him a bit more about how he got started in martial arts and all that. So uh, I just want to say welcome, uh, Sifu Dick Harrell. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. All right. So uh, I guess um, we should maybe just start, as I always kind of do with everyone, like uh, what we call the superhero origin story, as we say, uh, in the modern popularity of comic book (laughs) movies and such. Um, How did you get started in martial arts? Well, I got started back in 1971 uh, in Shotokan Karate. A friend of mine uh, had been bugging me to go with him to his school. I really didn't want to go. I was playing lots of sports then, and I was happy. But then, uh, as it were, we were in a high school, and we had a situation, a racially intense situation that we got jumped so after we got out of that situation thankfully safely i said okay i'm ready to go all right and, and <laughs> said, this I'm was ready to, i'm ready to go back to your school and this was uh north yes. carolina right this was charlotte north carolina oh, yes. okay so yeah because i know that's kind of the the area that larry was from so you know I, I i hope i think listeners that are gen x and older understand what was going on in that time period I think uh, those of you who are younger may or may not, depending on how good your history class is and how awake you were, <laughs> whether you slept right. or not, uh, right. but the early 1970s in that time period was the uh, the Civil Rights Bill had just been signed in 68, so you're talking about um, integration, um, potentially forced integration in, in southern states like North Carolina at that point, so there was a lot of, um, clearly contention in a lot of places, but I think a lot of contention and... Um, in in the southern states in in particular absolutely highly intense (laughs) so that there would be yeah i uh, you know i i think a group of views being jumped one way or the other uh it probably is not shouldn't be a shock i think to those who understand the time period yeah exactly so actually i started in shotokan karate uh with a gentleman both of which were partners together and they trained in the armed forces and the armed services back in Japan. So they ran a really strict school for us. Uh, it was very interesting, though, uh, very uh, highly motivating and intense. So I was there for about two and a half years, and then I got the opportunity to meet Larry, and I knew that he was a a former Bruce Lee student and I was very excited to meet him and very nervous to call him and ask him if I could become his student. 
<laughs> so that was a pretty big deal at the time. We only had two schools in Charlotte at the time, a Taekwondo facility and my Shotokan gym. That was it. Wow. So I decided, I decided to go Shotokan because I liked the hand techniques as they were more, they were about 50% each kicking and punching at that time. And so Taekwondo that was like 70-30 or something like that, if I remember. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, and that's that's pretty interesting because you know it's funny. I, I think if we think of our perspective back then, uh, now I started a good ten years later uh, than that. But even I think that it was still similar in that you looked at karate and you looked at taekwondo and you go, "Wow, those are so different." And now we look at them and go, "They're not that different, really." <laughs> that's true. Very true. And that's not an insult. You know, I'll say that, and boy, man, I'll have every karate guy and taekwondo guy in my face about it. But it's oh, like, oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. And it, and it's just kind of like, I, I understand what they're saying. Look, I can look at the different nuances of the two and go, yes, I can, I could give you a thousand differences between them. But exactly. in, the, in the larger picture, I'm going to say now that we've looked at things like Silat and Muay Thai and Chinese systems and jiu-jitsu and brazilian jiu-jitsu it's like now those things karate and taekwondo are very very almost the same <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah indeed well that's pretty neat so so tell me um so how was it you got introduced or you, you found out about larry was he covered in the newspaper or was it just sort of word of mouth through the martial art community there or? i had i had heard by word of mouth and uh i had heard from different friends of mine within my school and outside my school that this guy's uh, originally from Charlotte and uh, he was going to be teaching Jeet Kune Do in Charlotte. So I was very excited. I'd already seen uh, some Bruce Lee stuff and I, I was very excited to train with him. So I just wanted to see if he would take me as a student. So he asked me to come he was very, very nice, very cordial. He said, yeah, come on down. And he asked me to do a little interview or kind of uh, train in front of him and let him see what what I could do. So he had me do footwork drills and shadow box a little bit, which we didn't do a lot of shadow boxing in Shotokan, but that was very traditional Shotokan. But uh, <clears throat> had me do footwork, shadow boxing, that type of thing, hit the bag a little bit, hit the mitts a little bit, none of which we had done in Shotokan. So, but I had was fairly natural at the boxing portion, and I felt comfortable. So right after that, he accepted me, and uh, that's when I started training with him in 1974. In 74, we started, and I trained with him until 1982. Wow. It's yeah. Funny. Re really nice. Really nice. Uh, about eight years with him. That's great. That's great. I, I, I had about two and a half here from the time I got here and met him uh, to the time he passed. And uh, I would have loved to have had many, many more years. Um, I know. Such a such an interesting guy. So it, it's it's interesting that you talk about the 1974 because I just actually shared on social media uh, because I have the original, the letter that Dan and Asanto typed out for him, giving him that permission to teach, and it's dated, I believe, February 1st of 74. Wow, nice. Yeah, so I, I thought that was that was really cool, and I thought, you know what, I'll, I should share that a little bit to, so people can see it because I, I keep calling it, I think, the prototype of the modern-day instructor certification because i don't think people had that type of certification back in the day because you know everything, no, no. everything sort of had a rank you know like shotokan or, or taekwondo or even shorinru like i started in you'd have yes you know the belt ranks and you'd get a certificate with that belt rank and then there was never a separate one saying okay you can teach it was always i believe an assumption like, I think in Shorinru, it was the assumption was, uh, or the unspoken rule was second degree black belt. Once you hit second degree black belt, you could go teach, you could open a school or, or do whatever on that line. So, yes. I think it fell into that thing now with, with something like Jeet Kune Do, 
where there wasn't this ranking like that. So how does one then say, okay, you're able to teach? And I think that's kind of where this idea of instructor instructor certification came from. I, I may be way wrong, but that's just kind of using some logic. I think it makes sense. Yeah. Because, you know, and even at the time when I was with Larry, there was no formal announcement to me that I could start teaching. So over time, I got that from him. But right. it, it was in the beginning, there was no admission that I could start teaching the Jeet Kune Do at that point. Right. There just kind of yeah, used so to that, be a point, I along guess, the same way. Or, yeah, yes. Exactly. And I would hope after eight years, you know a little something. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, just a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So what was your um, what was your expectation before you'd met Larry? And then was it, uh, I would say, I, I say blown away because that was my perspective. I thought of him as being one way before I actually met him because I'd seen all yes. these photos of him in magazines where he looked just brutal. I mean, everything yeah. he was putting people in, in these photos, I'm like, oh my God, this guy's going to be just brutal. And, and I thought he was going to have this deep voice and sound very authoritative and all that. And he, yes. he wasn't, he's a, he's a lot more soft-spoken than you are. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> that says a lot. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's just, it just kind of blew me away when he came in and, uh, it, to me, it was a surprise. I didn't even know he taught here at the academy. So I had signed up. Yeah. And I came in, and he taught a Tuesday morning class. So I came in for this Tuesday class, and it was actually the day I signed up. And I sat there and was stretching, waiting for the class to begin. And I didn't realize that he I, – I saw a person sitting over by Guru's office. I just didn't, you know, stare at him and, and whatever. I just knew there was a person sitting there, and that person got up and walked over. And started class, and when I kind of looked up and my eyes adjusted, I'm like, oh, wait, I know who this is. And I said, wow, I didn't understand this guy was here and taught here. And wow. the moment he started speaking, I'm like, wow, he doesn't sound anything like I expected him to sound like. And he was almost right. shy. And I'm like, okay, this is kind of cool. I know this guy's a total, like, technician. Like, this guy can beat people up if he needs to. I mean, that's kind of yes. his reputation. But I'm like, I didn't expect that he would be so almost shy. And I thought that's kind yeah. of endearing to me. I mean, I thought that was pretty cool. Did he have the Southern accent? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. That, that, that blew me away. But he was from Charlotte. So he had, he had family here, brother here. And uh, so I should have expected that. But he was very unassuming. Right, yeah. Just like when I met him, he was very unassuming. It was it was very refreshing for me because he was a, a badass, to say the least. Oh, yeah. So it was very nice to, to find him that way. And uh, we trained together quite a bit in those days. He taught, he worked with a, with a uh, sheriff's department. He had some mental health uh experience as well so he worked a lot of shifts in the day and would come in and check on us the day group and hang out for a few minutes on his lunch then he'd go back to work so that was the way it went with him he came in to see the day classes but he taught at night uh -huh. i didn't go at night because i had night classes work as well so we had kind of a group that came about eight of us that trained in the daytime and then he had a group at night for the JKD class. So the day the day group was more fighter group. We we all sparred and we all fought. And then uh, the night group was different. They weren't just fighters. They wanted to learn Jeet Kune Do. And so it was nice. It was a nice balance. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. It's, you're giving me a great insight. Yeah. I had no idea how all that, that developed um, then and there. So yeah. did, did he usually set a, say, like a lesson plan for you guys during the daytime, or did you have an actual person that was sort of the leader of the group? Well, the day? no, he kind of he told us what he wanted us to work on informally. 
and uh, we all started off with a run, came back, stretched, got warmed up, shadow box, and then went on from there. Mitt work, bag work, that kind of thing. So that's kind of the way it went. But he, he was more of a, an informal, if not formal, teacher. Yeah, and and we we had a couple of guys that, that were more had more uh, experience in the daytime that could kind of run things, so that made it nice too. Yeah, yeah, it, and it's interesting because I I think um, I mean you had the Shotokan background and I did a Shonryu karate, but the the school also was um, a PKA kickboxing training school. Yeah, and so yeah. there was that as well and so the funny thing was by the time i I did jkd i was kind of used to the uh informal style of training where you're going to play some music and you're going to train and work out from the pk type kickboxing yeah and then you know i i I don't know i think i'm trying to think you know our audience is probably mostly people that have done jkd but i don't know if they've done a traditional martial art so i'm not sure how many people kind of understand the difference between the atmosphere of something that's like a traditional taekwondo or traditional karate class and then right what we do now um any thoughts on that (laughs) well we had we didn't have a lot of traditional martial artists in the early years Uh, those early years we had a lot of guys that were most and foremost interested in learning bruce lee's jeet kune do so we did a lot of uh, the shadow boxing, a lot of the freelance uh, training. So that was the difference. Was a, it wasn't as formal in those days. Right. Exactly. So if I, if I could say that, it was not as formal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's been my, my experience with just about everybody when it comes to like a JKD class with the exception of, I mean, like. Somebody like Sifu Yori, now we're talking to, like I said, his birthday is today, so happy birthday to Sifu Yori. Yeah. You know, I, I think he ran more of a, what I would call, a focused discipline type class in that way. Right. Not to say the other classes right. are not disciplined, it's just that he's he's Japanese, so it, it his his class, I, I'm familiar with the style, having come from karate, and I'm not saying he's teaching karate, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying right. that there, there is a type of demeanor that the instructor has and then the relationship of the student to the instructor especially in the class and the way you would address him or the way you would uh, relate to him is is a bit different than uh, you would in say the way I think a lot of JKD people train which is more like a kickboxing gym realistically there you go yeah exactly I don't think any of us called him Sifu in those days (laughs) Uh, it probably took a couple of years before we graduated to, and maybe Guru said to Larry, that needs to be happening. They need to be addressing you formally. I don't remember, but I'm thinking that might have happened at some point. Yeah. That, yeah. that he said, I, I want to be called Sifu. Yeah, I'm going to bet, but, you know, that has to do with the growth of people because yeah, there's, uh, right? there's so many people I can that I've met, you know, that, have been uh, Guru Dan's students for a long time, and they refer to right. him as Dan, and that's how they know him, and that's the way he he did it. Uh, in fact, my very first teacher of JKD and Kali was a guy who studied at the Aspen summer camps in the late seventies. He said even at that point in these things, everyone was Dan, Tim Tackett was Tim, Chris Kent was Chris. You know, they right. addressed each other by first names. And I, I yeah. think, you know, when you start talking about the growth, like when there just all of a sudden becomes thousands of people in your organizations and that, then, yeah, you know, that kind of thing can probably potentially get abused where sure. people are going to start referring to someone like him by first name. And then it gives this impression to other people out there that they're close friends and they're not necessarily. So I, I, I think I get why that had to be done. At one point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it gets it gets interesting. There was uh, when I first went to this uh, Cambodian uh, kickboxer Omri Bon that you know we've been training with ever since. So 
went down there with uh, Guru Dan, and he introduced me to them as his friend, Tim. And I'm thinking, oh, really? that's very nice. I'm still going to always call you Guru. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Regardless to whether I'm elevated to friend status or not, I'm going to call right. you through. <laughs> yeah, as it should be. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, and Sifu Larry was always Sifu. It didn't matter where I was at. I was calling yeah. that. It's like I, you know, it's like I've I've read too much about you. I've got you know, and again we be we became close, but I'm just going to always call you by a respectful title i just i think you know you've earned that. that's good <laughs> you've earned it exactly yeah, absolutely you know it doesn't mean that it changes any of my love affection or uh you know condition of our relationship it's just that you know you've earned this title so uh i'm just gonna call you that you know Rick right. Young even even told me that once. He said, because uh, I kept calling him Sifu. He's like, call me Rick. And I said, well, Sifu, maybe in 20, 30 years, I'll, I'll get used to that and I'll try it. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right now, it's just going to be Sifu. <laughs> That's it. So Very there, true. There was a... You know... Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you, no, you go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, there is. Uh, you were involved, uh, got involved at a very interesting period... Uh, being that, you know, Bruce had just passed, right? And yes. um, one of the things, or one of the things, or the thing maybe Larry Hartzell is known for is the grappling end. And it's always that Absolutely. Uh, discussion about how that was being developed at the time that Bruce Lee had passed. And then, you know, the man yes. kind of fell upon um, Larry to research and, and do that. And so you were kind of involved in that early phase there when he was right developing that so what was that like well i want to tell you first we focused primarily with larry on the boxing and the trapping he got very very good in both to the point that most of the classes would be geared toward boxing and trapping uh but you got to remember he had not moved to California yet. He didn't move to California until 19, I believe, uh, 82. Mm -hmm. So um, that that changed things considerably. But in the beginning, it was for him just the boxing and trapping for the most part. Footwork, fainting, all the, all the boxing aspects of what would then be Jeet Kune Do aspect. I'm so glad you said that. We, yeah, <laughs> because, we didn't do a lot of a lot of trap, a lot of grappling yet. I, I, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm surprised to say, but we did not do a lot of traffic yet in, in those early stages until he got. To and this concludes the abbreviated version of the podcast. Please consider supporting the program by going to www.patreon.com slash M-A-L-M-A-G and subscribing to the show. You can also purchase this individual episode or any individual episode at our Gumroad page. That's M-A-L-M-A-G dot Gumroad dot com. Thank you for listening to this episode with Dick Harrell. Coming up next week, what is the intersection of UCLA, Indiana University, and Kali that is good for your brain? That is Paul McCarthy. Our Malmag online store at martialartslifestylemagazine.com has a full selection of Timmy B's brand sticks for FMA and Krabiker Bong. Timmy B's brand now selling in Japan as well. Beautiful Timmy B's brand shirts and Dos Manos shirts are available with new t-shirt designs and more products coming soon. An online course in the Dos Manos method for FMA is available under the Courses tab. More courses coming soon. Check out the Places to Train tab to find schools near you and click on the Events Calendar page to see what seminars and events are happening all around the world. And of course, visit our main page for articles on the martial arts. Music by Jack L. Relic. Martial Arts Lifestyle Magazine and the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast are trademarked and copyrighted by TNT LLC. Yeah.